so this is what I, I ended with last time, the, the statement of the Bertini smoothness theorem over a finite field. And so just to quickly remind you what the setup was. So okay, so you start with projective space over a finite field, and you have a smooth subvariety or subscheme, some quasi-projective subscheme X inside there. So it's okay, so it's smooth of say dimension M. And what we're going to do is cut X with hypersurfaces, hypersurfaces in Pn, and we'll want to count which of those intersections are also smooth. Well, in, in, in that case, I mean, smooth of, of dimension one less. So, so okay, so some Fs will set some polynomials, some homogeneous polynomials F will, will define a hypersurface that cuts X in a, in a smooth, a smooth subscheme and others won't. And we want to know what the density of the good ones are, the ones that cut X in something smooth. And the, the answer that I claimed last time is that the density of the set of good F is given by this special value of, zeta, of a zeta function. Namely, well, it's the zeta function of X evaluated at S equals M plus one, where M was the dimension of X. And then inverse of that. Okay. All right, so today I'm going to explain how you, how you might prove something like this. And the proof is going to follow the same sort of broad outline as the proof of the statement about square free integers. So, okay, so let's, so how is this going to go? So actually, I'm not going to prove it. I'm not going to prove the whole thing. I'm only going to prove a special case. But the special case I'm going to prove contains all the key ideas of the main, of the main example, of the main theorem, of the whole theorem. So. Um, so, okay, so I'll just, so I'm, I'm not going to be losing, I mean, you're not going to be losing too much insight by just restricting this case. So it's, I'm going to do the case where X is just A2 sitting inside the ambient space P2. All right. So, so in this case, the, the, the homogeneous polynomials F, I mean, you might as well dehomogenize them. So, okay, so, and then identify these homogeneous polynomials F with those dehomogenizations. So, okay, so, so I'm gonna de identify this with its dehomogenization, which may be F bar, which is F of one X Y. So this is now just a polynomial, just not necessarily homogeneous in, in X and Y over a finite field. And we're now just looking at the affine plane curve that this polynomial defined. And I said identify it, so from now on I'm going to call F bar just F. Okay, so, so this polynomial belongs, has satisfies this property. Okay, is this visible actually? Not really? Okay. Well, that's a P. All right, <laughs> so. Okay, so, uh, okay. I know that didn't really help, but okay. Oh. Now you can really see the P. <laughs> All right. Okay, so, I mean, wait, you probably remember what P, are, P is. That's the set of good, the get a set of good Fs, the ones such that HF intersects X in something smooth. Okay, so, yeah, so, and to test whether the, this intersection is smooth, I mean, that's the same as, as saying, well, in this case, X is essentially the whole, I mean, it's, it's an A2 inside P2. So we're just asking about the hypersurface itself, which is some smooth curve now, or sorry, it might be smooth, but, and so to say that F belongs to P is, is the same as saying that this hypersurface is smooth at every point of, of A2. So, so smooth, and I won't, I won't keep writing this, but of dimension one. Uh, so a smooth of dimension one, you can check at one closed point at a time. So each, at each closed point P of A2 over the finite field. All right, so, and now how do you test whether something is smooth at a, at a given point? Well, for each point P, if you want to know that HF, this, this, this curve, if you want to know that it's smooth at P, um, by definition, well, that, that you have to check certain partial derivatives. So check whatever great Jacobian criterion. So first of all, F has to, in order for it to, to be smooth, 
one of these quantities should be not zero. So these, so these three numbers are not all zero. Yeah, so not smooth would mean, first of all, the hypersurface would have to pass through P, and then the two partial derivatives would have to be zero there in order for it to be not smooth. Okay, so, so that's the condition for it to be not smooth. By the way, these, um, these, these, these values, what I really mean by this, to evaluate at a closed point, you just take the, the polynomial, say partial f, partial x, and then you reduce it, you look at its image in, in the polynomial ring modulo the maximum ideal corresponding to p. So that, that's what, the, and so these, these numbers, they're taking values, so they're, they're gonna be, all three of these are in the residue field at the point p, which is, which is the same thing as well, it's, an ex it's a fine extension of FQ. It's going to be FQ raised to, well, whatever the degree of that point is. So based on this, you can, you can give a fake proof of, of the Bertini theorem in this case by just, just estimating, what, okay, what's the chance that all those three numbers are zero? Okay. So the fake proof would be that, well, the, the probability that HF is smooth at P, that should be, well, I mean, the bad ones are the ones for which all three numbers are zero, and the chance for each number to be zero is, is one out of Q to the degree of P. So altogether, it should be one, the bad ones are gonna be one over Q to the three degree P. And so the, the good ones, the ones for it is smoother, it should be that probability. And then if you, well, and then this, well, this is where it really starts getting fake. Uh, you, you start, you say, okay, what do you want, if you want this to be smooth at all P, then at all P in, at all P in A2, then that, well, that should be, if these things are independent, it should be the infinite product over all such points P of, of one minus this. So it's, it's the same, it's the same as the fake heuristic for square free integers. Um, and, and well, so yeah, so, so well, it, it's, it's completely analogous to that. And so this, and this is exactly the definition of the zeta, the zeta value of a, of, of the plane at, at three inverse. Okay, so that, ex, so, well, that ex sort of explains why, why the theorem should be true. And well, the only question is how do you make sense of, of how, do you, how do you actually argue that, the, that you're allowed to take this infinite product and these, these conditions are really independent. So, so okay, so how do, you, how, do you, how do you justify all those, 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 those claims? Well, we're gonna break up the, the, the we're gonna impose the conditions of smoothness at each point by sieving out at each, for each point the bad ones. So at, e at every close point, we're gonna sieve out all the ones that are singular at that point. And then we'll, well, we'll start by sieving out the low degree points, the, 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 the ones that are singular at low degree points, and then we'll sieve out the ones at the medium degree points, and we'll do the sieve out the ones at high degree points. So, yeah, and then we'll see what's left. So, so first, okay, let's look at the low degree points. Yes, yeah, so maybe I, before I even say this, let's say, oh, okay. So let's let's look at let's let's, let's say we're going to now this sort of the the number line of closed points measuring by degree. We're going to have some cutoff r, and, and then there'll be another cutoff which in this in this one is going to be at d over three if we're looking at polynomials f of degree three, and we'll these will be the boundaries between low low medium and high. So 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 the points of Degree in this range will be the, the the closed points of medium degree. Okay, so let's start now. So one is the low degree points, and so okay. Do you remember what we did for sort of square free integers? So what we did then, if you want to know what's the chance that an integer is not divisible by two squared, not divisible by three squared, and all the way up to not divisible by p squared, where p is about r, then you could understand that by looking by using the Chinese remainder theorem. You look at all integers modulo two squared times three squared times blah, 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 up to r squared. 
And then if you know what the integer is modulo that, then that tells you what it's, whether it's divisible by any of those prime squareds up to r. Okay, so, so what's the analog here? Well, we're gonna, so we're gonna define an approximation to the, to the set P of the good ones. These are gonna be the ones that are smooth at least as far as the low degree points are concerned. So they're the, the, the F such that HF is smooth at P for all P, so, at, at, so for all P in A2 up to, up to degree R, so degree less than or equal to R. And hope that that's pretty close, that the, the rest of the closed points don't sieve out too much. So we'll have to justify that later. Okay, so, so what's the density of this set? Well, the claim is that it's gonna be, I mean, you can easily guess what it's gonna be just by the same here as to here. It should just be the product of these numbers for, for just these closed points, the, these finely many closed points of degree up to R. So that should be one minus one over Q to the degree, three degree P. Okay, so how do, how do you prove that? Well, so we're gonna, we're gonna look at the, the maximal ideal corresponding to each closed point. So that's gonna be a maximal ideal in, well, we're talking about A2, so it's just a maximal ideal of the polynomial ring, FQ join XY. So this will be the maximal ideal corresponding to P. And how do you, and how do you know in terms of these maximum ideals, how do you express the fact that F equals zero is smooth at P? Well, if you want to, if you want to pose these conditions at many primes, then just as we were looking at integers, modulo two squared, three squared, up to r squared, you should take i to be the, pro the product of, of, these, of these mp squareds for all the primes, uh, for, all the, for all the closed points of degree up to r. And then everything's gonna be determined by what f looks like modulo i. So then, yeah, so the, if you're looking at polynomials of degree d, this belongs to this set that's good at, uh, as far as the, the close points up to, of degree up to R are concerned, that's gonna be, that's gonna hold, if and only if the image of F modulo all these squares, is, is, is non-zero in each component. So, so we're gonna look at the polynomials of degree up to D, so that's where F essentially lives after the dehomogenization. And we're gonna map it by, by reducing into the polynomial ring modulo this ideal I. Yeah, and what's that isomorphic to? Well, I mean, you can use the Chinese remainder theorem. That's gonna be the, just the product of FQ XY modulo the, the square of MP. So over these, over these places over these closed points. Yeah, and so the, and the, we wanna say that the image of this sh should be non-zero in each factor. Because, okay, because what does it mean if, some, if one of these Fs maps to zero? Say at the origin, what does, what does it mean if F maps to the origin in, this fa in one of these factors? That means that F has no constant term and it also has no linear term, I mean, the, the, the polynomial if you look at it. So, and if it has no constant term and no linear term, that means it's passing through the origin and also the, it's gonna be singular at the origin. So that's, so that's the, the, we wanna count the ones that are not, not singular at the origin. So we want the ones that, that map to something non-zero in each of these factors. And so, okay, so we wanna count these. And this is gonna be an easy thing to count as long as phi sub d is surjective. Because if phi sub d is surjective, well, I mean, it's just a linear map. So you'll know how many polynomials map to each point then, if it's surjective, just because all the fibers will have the same size. And so then it'll just be a matter of looking at this product and seeing in this product how many of the elements of this product are non-zero in every factor. And that'll just be the, 
That'll just be the product over all primes the, that we were expecting. It'll be this, that'll give this answer. So the real question is whether phi sub d is surjective or not. It's just like asking if you look at all the integers up to b, and you want those to equidistributed, be equidistributed roughly when you reduce the mod 2 squared times 3 squared up to r squared. And that'll be true as long as b is greater than the product of those squares. Of primes. And so this, this also will hold when, once d is large enough. Well, I mean, it's kind of, actually, it's kind of obvious that this is going to be surjective when d is large enough because, well, I mean, this is just a finite vector space. And if you take all polynomials of all degrees, well, that, that definitely surjects. And so eventually, it is, you're going to have to find polynomials that map to all the generators there. Okay, so it's, it's clear that this is going to be surjective. So that, actually, that completes the proof. All right, so that's, so it's surjective as, lo as, long as, as long as D is large. I mean, but you might not be very satisfied about this, with this because it doesn't tell you how large D has to be. And actually, for the next step, for studying medium degree primes, we'll, we'll need to know how large D has to be. So let me say a little bit more. How can you tell when, it's, when this map is surjective? Um, let's see, is that still visible? Yeah, okay. So, okay, so how large must D, must D be? Well, so to study this, let me just introduce, let me just call V sub D, let's call that the, the image of this linear map, V sub D. And I want to study this as D starts increasing. And one way, you can think of this as sort of a, a dynamical system where you each, each V sub D, well, V sub D plus one is, is is obtained by a certain process from V sub D, namely to get, well, I mean, how do you, if you have all the polynomials of total degree up to D, how do you get the polynomials of degree up to D plus one? One way to do it is to take, take the ones you already have, take sums of those with X times something you all, of something of degree D, and also take a sum with something that's Y times something in V sub D. So that's a process that takes as input a vector space VD you know, of polynomials or, or of images of polynomials, polynomials modulo ideal, and then you do something to that vector space and you get the next vector space. And so now you can study, well, okay, so suppose you start with V0, which is just the, the polynomial, it's just the constant polynomials. So, and so that's going to be a one-dimensional space. And what happens each time you apply this operation to get to V1? Well, it's eventually, it's going to start growing for a while. And eventually you'll get, you'll get a repeat. So, I mean, well, because this is all happening inside this finite dimensional space here. So it has to stabilize at some point. So what happens when it stabilizes? You get two, well, you, you get two repeated things. But from that on, from then on, it has to be equal forever because, because this is, because of the kind of process this is. This process didn't care about the index you were talking about. It just looked at the vector space. So if, if applying this process to this V sub D produces v, the same vector space, then it's, you're, gonna, you, you're just going to be get, doing the same thing from then on. And we know that this is surjective eventually, so this, when, it, when, it, when this happens, when you get this stabilization, it must then already be surjective. So the only question is how long does it take to get to this point where it's, where it has stabilized? And it has to be pretty soon because there can't be that many steps in this chain of vector spaces because it's all happening inside a, a vector space of, of, a fig, of, a, of dimension we know. So, so this D, you can say, is, must be at most the dimension of, of the whole vector space, which was the whole vector space in which these things live, which is, which is this, which is that. Okay, so, so the conclusion of this was that thus phi sub d is surjective for, well, for, for once, once the d is greater than or equal to this cutoff d. So, yeah, so in particular, if d is greater than, you're guaranteed that it's going to be surjective if you take it bigger than the dimension of, of the space that you're trying to fill up. Okay, so that's so, so that's that's what I want to. That's the quantitative version of that of that lemma. And 
So now I want to apply this to study the medium degree points. Yeah, so just remind you where we are. So, so you, are, you are here right now. We've handled, we've sieved out all the, all the closed points up to R. And we've gotten essentially the right answer, except we well, it's only a finite product, but it's pretty close to, to, to what we want. And we want to, now we want to show that sieving out the, the smoothness, I mean, the, say, sieving out the ones that are singular at high degree points or in medium sized degree points, that doesn't change things much. So we want to show there are not very many polynomials that have singularities at high degree points or medium degree points. Okay, so what is the set that, what are we trying, what, what is the set that we need to bound now? So for the medium degree. So let's, let me call that Q sub R. So this is gonna be the set of, well, it's, it'll be the union. If I'm looking at polynomials of all, the homogeneous polynomials of all degree, um, that's just so that I can talk about the density. So I can talk about taking the limit as D goes to infinity. I want to take all the polynomials F such that there exists a closed point P with a point that's of medium sized degree, so which means that the degree of that point should be between R and D over three, because that was my earth, that was my upper bound, that was my cutoff between medium and high. And there should be exist such exists such a point at which the hypersurface is not smooth. Since so these are the ones that are I want to get sieve out. And so the question is, what's the what's the density of this set? I'm hoping I'm hoping the density will be small. And more precisely, I'm hoping that the the upper density of this set will go to zero as r goes to infinity. Because at, at the very end, r is going to be, be slow, growing slowly. Okay, so how do you, how do you bound this? Well, we're, you're going to use the, the stupid bound on the union again. So just the, the size of a union. Well, I mean, okay, not this union, but the union, over, this is really a union over points P. For each point P, it sieves out something. And I'll just count how many are sieved out by each, by each closed point individually. So, okay, so let's look at what gets sieved out by, the, by one particular P. So if you fix one of these P's, the, the real question is, is which of those polynomials map to zero in the quotient by the maximum ideal squared, since that's the condition for singularity at P. And what I'm claiming is, and that's easy to count because this is gonna be surjective. Do you know why this is going to be surjective for these p's? Yeah, it's it's a consequence of this because we're just applying this where i now is just this is just this, this m p squared. So and so what's the yeah, what's the dimension of this thing? Um, well, this is this is really like a well, I mean it, it's gonna, it's 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 like it's 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 something of length three over over the over for over the residue field of of MP. I mean it's 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 the same as the counting the number of values of F and the, the number of values of the two partial derivatives. To say, it's it's like three conditions over the residue field of of P to say that something is zero there. So yeah, so this so and then yeah, so that this is of dimension three times the degree of P and D is larger than that. So this is so this since d is, is, is larger than three degree of p. That's, that's because that's how, that's, how this, that's how the medium size was defined. So, it, so given that, it's, it's, so it's surjective, and therefore the number of this, well, this density is going to be at most the sum over all these points p and I guess there should be a limb soup in here, because I'm taking this upper density. Limb soup as d goes to infinity, of the sum over all these points p with degree between r and d over three. Of, and then the fraction of things that go to zero is exactly the fraction of elements of this space that are zero, which is one out of the total size, which is q to the 3d degree p. And this is small. And the reason it's small is because the number of closed points of any given degree on A2 is at most, well, it's at most the number of points on A2 of, 
over FQ to the E. If you're trying looking at points of degree E, they're going to be most Q to the E squared points in, in A2. So, so it's, that's like Q to the two times degree P, and then we're, but we're, we're summing over one over Q to the three degree P. So it's going to be bounded by some geometric series, and we're already, and we're starting the geometric series pretty far out because R is going to be medium, well, fairly large. So this is going to be small depending on how R, large R is, and it's going to tend to zero as, as R goes to infinity. So that, so that, that, that's it for the medium, the medium size, the medium degree prime, the medium degree closed points. Okay, so now for the tricky part. So, so, so now, okay, so, well, back to, so now you are, you are now here. So we've done, we've handled these, we've handled these, these, these don't sieve out much. Now we want to know that, that it's very rare to have, for a plane curve to have a, a really high degree singularity. So greater, a degree greater than D over three, when, where D is the degree of the curve. So, all right, so let's, so before I do this, let me just do a, a little warm-up lemma. So suppose you look at all, you, you fix a sub in, 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 in the plane. Actually, it's going to be a curve here. So let's say an A2. And, and it's, and it's, a, it's, so it's, it's, say it's of dimension one. So, so what's the, or actually, let's, it could also be the whole thing. It doesn't really matter. If I take if I take all the polynomials that how many of them vanish on z? So if I take all the polynomials of degree up to d, the question is how many are there that vanish on this subvariety z? And well, just to make it just let's say uh, how many of them as a compared to the total number of polynomials of of degree up to d? So as you can, make my guess, it's pretty, if you take a random curve and you ask for a random polynomial to vanish on it, usually it's not going to happen. And in fact, one way to see this, well, okay, so the, the claim is that it's going to be at most q to the minus d. And so here's, here's a proof. So it's going to be a, a question of linear algebra. So you ch choose a coordinate x, one of either x or y. So, so choose a coordinate. So let's say uh, one of the two coordinates of an on E2, say, say x, such that x is non-constant on, is non-constant on the, on the, on the, on the variety z. And now let's look at the map that takes polynomials of degree d to their restrictions, to the f functions on functions on z, functions on sorry on z, and so we're trying to bound the size of the kernel. So that's the well, okay. So this num numerator. Well, okay. How do, how can you bound the size of a kernel? Well, you, there's this thing called rank nullity theorem. So. <laughs> So you just have to find the, the rank of this, of this map, which is essentially finding the, I just taught this in, in my linear, in linear algebra, so I, I'm an expert on this right now. So this, if you take the, what, how many, how many different functions can you get by taking polynomials of degree d and restricting to this curve? Well, x is not constant on z, and so you can at least get, in the image of this, you at least get, fun, you get these functions, and these are all linearly independent. Because if they were if they were linear dependence, that would mean that well there would be only that would mean you'd have some polynomial of x that vanished on z, and that would mean that x was not really a, a non constant function on on this. I guess I should say non constant. I, I really mean yeah. I mean if it's an irreducible curve, then it's 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 not going to be yeah. So it's not going to it's not going to have just finitely many values. It's going to x is going to be really a parameter on z. So yeah, and how many? Oh, and how many of these do you get? You get you get to go up to x to the d because we're looking at all polynomials of x up to d. So actually, the image of this map is at least oh, it's actually even d plus one dimensional. So so that means that the kernel is going to be small. The kernel is going to be of co-dimension at least d d plus one in here. So okay, so I could have put a d plus one, but okay, let me not worry about the plus one. So 
But anyway, this shows that it's very rare to have for polynomials to vanish on a, on a particular curve. If you specify a z, it's, it's, there are not very many polynomials that vanish on z. Okay, so that's, 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 that's going to be a, a dilemma that's used in the high degree points. Now I'm ready to, to do it. So, so this is, this is, this is, this is going to be the hard part. So, cause, because there are infinitely many closed points of high degree, and we have to know that all, to, all of them together don't sieve out very much. So, yeah, so to be precise, what we're trying to bound now is the set of, well, we're, we're trying to bound the set of polynomials of degree d such that there exists a high degree singularity. So there exists a p with degree p greater than d over 3 at which the plane curve is not smooth. So it's singular. Okay, and the, the 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 conclusion that we want is that that this, that this is a this is a low that this is negligible, so that the density of this set is, is zero. So n essentially nothing, essentially nothing gets sieved out, or, or, or asymptotically nothing gets sieved out. Okay, so how do you do this? I mean, you can't just do it one prime at one closed point at a time because there are infinitely many. So instead, we're going to do something weird. We're going to generate this f in, in a ran we want to take a random f, but we're going to generate it in a weird way. So we're going to take f, and we're going to define it to be, okay, so uh, bear with me. This will, this will look like it's out of nowhere for a moment. And, okay. So I'm going to take something like this, where, where these, these, these polynomials in, in this expression are themselves random. So I, I generate these f0, g1, g2, and h rand randomly, and they're of, of degrees, well, let's say, okay, so f, f0 will be of degree up to d, and g1 will be up to degree d minus 1 over p. That's just so that this thing ends up being of degree d, so I don't want d, g1 to be any bigger than that. And same for g2. And h should, can go up, to, I guess, to d over p. Okay, now, the, the, now if I do this, if I generate this f in this way, this f is a random, uniformly, uniform random element of, of the polynomials of degree up to d. And that's just because, well, it doesn't even matter what g1, g2, and h were, because I just added in just a random f0 of degree d. That's going to make it random no matter what the other ones are doing. So, okay, so, so, but why would, okay, why would you ever want to generate a random polynomial in this way? The reason is that in terms of this, in terms of this, I can write down formulas for what the partial derivatives are. So the, the, the partial derivative of f, I mean, the, here's, okay, here's the point. The, a p power acts like a constant as far as taking derivatives is concerned. So if you, so, so, yeah, so the, so the derivative with respect to x, the partial derivative, is the same as, well, the partial derivative of f0, and then plus, well, okay, there's, there's an x there, so then you get g1 to the p. And then the other things are just constants as far as x is concerned. And then similarly, there's another formula for the partial with respect to y, and it's something similar, except now it's going to be g2 to the p. Yeah, okay, so then, so... For, for, the, for an f that's generated this way, you get these expressions for the derivatives. And by, by choosing these polynomials one at a time, I can make it so that after I choose f0, I can sort of understand the, the I can impose these conditions on the derivatives that, that, that are in the smoothness. I can impose them one at a time as well. And so I don't have to sort of study everything at once. I can just hand, look at one one vanishing condition at a time. So, because the, the singularities, remember, are the places where f is zero and partial f, partial x is zero, and partial f, partial y is zero. So I want to show that it's pretty rare to have high degree points in the, in the zeros of all three polynomials. Okay, so here's what, okay, so we're going to choose f zero first. So given f zero, there, there, well, how many, G1s are there that make the partial f partial x zero? Well, there is at most one. 
there's a most one choice of, there's a most one G1 such that this partial becomes zero. And that's just because of the formula for this. I mean, if F0 is, if you already know what F0 is, um, G1 has to be a particular thing. In fact, there might not be any G1s that make this polynomial identically zero. Yeah, so this, I should put it as identically zero. And so that means in terms of probability, so this is gonna be part one, what's the probability that if I've already chosen F0, so conditioned on, on a choice of F0, what's the probability that the, the, the G1 is such that when I, imp when I impose the, the vanishing of that partial derivative, that this, that this, this sub variety is actually a curve as opposed to being all of A2. Well, it's pretty good. I mean, because it's going to be a curve as long as this partial derivative is not zero, and there's only one bad G1. So it's essentially all of the G1. So this is approximately, it's approximately one. Okay, so now I'm going to imagine that F0 and G1 are fixed and ask what's the probability that conditioned on a choice of F0 and G1, what's the probability that G2 is such that the dimension of, of the locus cut out by both partial derivatives? Because the singularities are going to have to be places where both partial derivatives are zero. What's the probability of that is cut is now, well now, but I want it to be dimension zero. So what's the probability that G2 will make this happen? So in other words, I want to make sure that, yeah, so when could, how could this fail? I mean, how could it fail if this extra polynomial doesn't cut down the dimension of this locus? So this, this thing will fail only if this partial derivative It, if and only if the partial derivative vanishes on some component of the previous locus. So, and, the, and this partial derivative is, is, is this expression. So it's if and only if, if this vanishes on one of the curves in this locus. So it vanishes on some, on some component some irreducible component of, 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 the, the, of the, the, this one-dimensional locus. Okay, but for that to happen, G2 must be something very particular. For, I mean, it must, I mean the, the set of G2s that satisfy this is it either going to be empty or it's going to be a coset of, this, of the polynomials that vanish on, this, on that component. And so this, this number, you can just bound this for each component using that little lemma I proved before the one about z, and so, the, so that's going to be very small. In fact, it's going to be something like q to the minus d. And the number of components is only about d. So the whole thing is going to be like d times q to the minus d, which is still tiny. So, this is, so it's very rare for this to fail. So this is also approximately one. Yeah, because this is, so this, is, this, is pro this whole thing is like probability about, about q, or d times q to the minus d, something like that. Okay, so now we've imposed two of the conditions in order for singular, and what's the third one? It's that the, the polynomial f itself must be there. I mean, it doesn't count as a singular point on the, the hypersurface f equals zero if it's not actually on the, the hypersurface. So, yeah, so among these points, which, what's the probability that f itself vanishes on, 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 this zero, on one of the components of this zero-dimensional locus? So now we're looking at the probability so it's conditioned on a choice of F0, G1, and G2 as above, such that this, so far it's working, it's been cutting down. What's the probability that, and now my last thing to choose is H. And so what's the probability that H arranges for, is such that this, this now triple intersection, F equals zero, partial F, X equals zero, and partial F, Y equals zero. 
But now I, do, I well, I don't want to say it's empty because it probably won't be empty. There's always a, a positive chance that it vanishes on some closed point. But I don't need this to be completely empty. I'm just trying to show that there are no singularities of high degree. So I just want to know that this has has no points, no closed points of degree that's high. So a degree greater than d over 3. And so for that, well, I mean, how could this fail? Well, look at how many points there were in the previous locus. And that you can bound by Bezu's theorem. Because these are polynomials of degree d minus 1. So there are most d minus 1 squared points up here. And so for each, for each of those points, you can figure out how many of the h's make f vanish there. And so it's the same kind of calculation. And so this, this probably also turns out to, it's very rare for this to fail. So it's again about 1. And so now if you put all these together, you find that the conclusion, you get the conclusion you want. That it's very rare for an f to give you a singularity of, high, of degree greater than d over 3. OK, so that's essentially, that's almost, that's almost the end of the proof. That finishes the proof of this lemma here, that sieving at the large primes doesn't do much. And so now if you put that all together, you can, so the end of the proof, well, now it's, now it's the end, now the end of the proof is easy. So you just say, well, you, you, you wanted to count all the p's that gave you a smooth intersection. Those are the ones that were, that were, were almost smooth. They're smooth up to the, at least at the low degree points. And then you had to sieve out the ones that had medium degree singularities and also sieve out the ones that had high degree singularities. So as a set, those, those are the, that's the set of good hyper, hypersurfaces or good polynomials. And now, if you want to know the den we want to know the density of it. And as, de as r tends to infinity, we know that, well, the density of PR is just that finite product. And the finite product tends to the infinite Euler product, which was this, as, as r tends to infinity. And we knew that the upper density, sort of the error terms coming from, from um, sieving out, doing this extra sieving for the medium sized prime, well, that was negligible as, for a large R. And, and R itself, and for, this, for the large primes, it's, it's already, it's not even tending to zero, it just is zero. So, so, so if you put those together, that, that completes the proof. That pr proves that, that the density of, of, of these, good hype, these good plane curves is exactly this. OK, so that's the end of the proof. And the proof of the general Bertini theorem, I mean, this was just for A2 and P2, but it works exactly the same way in higher dimensions. So if you have any x in the end, you'll, you'll get a product over all the closed points of x, and you'll have some, a bunch of partial derivatives you need to vanish, but it's the same idea. So that's, that's, the, that's, that's, the, that's it. And so now let me, let's see, so how, we've got how much time left? Ten, until 10 after. OK, so there are five minutes left. OK, all right. So, so, let's, so let me just talk about a couple of applications now. So, OK, so let me put the theorem back. So here's the Bertini smoothest theorem, which may be a sort of invisible except for the P. Uh, but anyway, um, well, OK, one thing you can do. So here's some applications or, or some, also some variants of this. You, could, you, can do, you can do special things at finally many points and impose smoothness everywhere else. So you can have the same theorem, but you can, for example, you could force the hypersurface to pass through your favorite point of P2 or Pn. So you could say, OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, so in more generally, you can, you can prescribe not just that it passes through a point, but you can prescribe Taylor coefficients of the polynomial f. As long as you don't do something silly like, impose so many Taylor coefficients to force it to be singular somewhere. As long as you don't do that, then, then you'll, you'll, you can still get a positive density of polynomials. And you can get an exact formula for the density of the, of the, of the Fs that cut x smooth and that have these prescribed Taylor coefficients. And so as an application of this, you can, you can, we can, you can answer a, a question of, of Nick Katz, which is also answered independently by Offer Gaber. So this is about space filling curves. So what is this about? Um, well, this is space filling curves over finite fields, not the usual space filling curves. This is, 
So here, the setup is you're given a nice variety. And uh, for me, nice is a technical term. So nice means smooth, projective, and geometrically integral. OK, that's, that's what nice means. I didn't invent this. OK. So nice, smooth, projective, and geometric. So, but that, that is really, that's as, about as nice as you can get as, as far as varieties are concerned. OK, so, but then the conclusion is you can find a nice curve inside x that passes through all the points of x. And when I say all the points, I don't really mean all the closed points. I just mean the fq points. So all the points in, in x of f q. So I mean, okay, how do you prove this? Well, okay, so you have your x, your, it's your huge dimension. You have these finally many f q points on x. And, and you apply the Bertie smoothness theorem to say, okay, I can find a hypersurface that's gonna cut my original x, but I'm gonna force my hypersurface to pass through all these points. And so by doing that, you'll cut down x to a smaller sub-variety of, 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 of one lower dimension that still contains all the same point, fq points. And now you repeat. And you can, you can also show as you do this just by that, that what you get at each stage is connected. That, that's, a, that's a, some lemma in Hartshorn chapter 3, section 7. Anyway. So it's, and so that if you take a smooth projective variety of, of dimension at least two and you cut with a hyper, hyperplane or hypersurface, you get something that's connected. And if you have something that's connected and smooth, connected and smooth implies that it's integral. So, so, the, so, you, so each stage, you're, you're still getting nice things. Everything is nice as you slice. You, you just apply the Bertin theorem over and over again, each, each time making sure that it passes through the, all the points that you want to keep, and eventually you get down to a curve that passes through all the points. So that's the space filling curve because it goes through all the FQ points. And you can, if you want, you can also do the opposite. You can make, you can find, you can find a, a smooth curve that misses all the points, or you can just have it pass through your favorite points and not the other ones, or, or you can do things like that. And as another application, maybe I can mention. Well, okay, you can you can prove that abelian varieties. Uh, you can get abelian varieties as quotients of Jacobians. Of, of quotients of Jacobians of curves that are contained in the in the in the abelian variety. So so here's the here's the statement. So if you're given a over f q, let's say it's of dimension at least one. Otherwise, it's kind of stupid. So all right. So that's an abelian variety. Then there exists a nice curve inside a x inside a such that. It's Jacobian. If you look at the induced map from the Jacobian onto a, to, to a, then well, then it's onto. So it's surjective. So how do you prove this? The, the trick is you find you make x go through all the L torsion points. You choose a prime L that's not not, not the characteristic. You find x passing through all L torsion points of A. And by doing that, well, what, what could the image of the Jacobian be in that setting? If you look at the image of the Jacobian of X, that's going to be some abelian subvariety. And how many torsion points does that abelian subvariety has? Have? It has all the same L torsion points that A does. So what could so could it have smaller dimension? No, it's got way too many L torsion points. So so this this is a trick due to offer gobber. So has 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 the same number of L torsion points, which is L squared raised to the dimension, just like an elliptic curve has L squared points. An abelian variety of dimension dimension A has this many L torsion points. So has this many L torsion points. So so that means the the so yeah so that means the dimension can't be any smaller than dimension of A. Yeah. So okay. So and let's see what else can I tell you. So there's some ni other nice extensions of the theorem. There's a semi-ample Bertin theorem due to Melanie Wood and, and Daniel Ehrman. And then there's also we so there's also a Bertini irreducibility theorem that's over a finite field that I, I proved with Francois Charles. But that uses completely different ideas because irreducibility is not something you can check locally. 
it's not a local, it's not something you can check close point by close point. But anyway, there's some theorem. And uh, one of my favorite applications is one that was done by a student of mine about, about eight, eight, nine years ago. And Nhi Nguyen? Okay, I'm not very good at uh, Yeah, maybe I can write the name. So, so this will be the last thing I'll say. So, so this was part of his, his thesis. So I like to call it the uh, Whitney embedding theorem for finite fields. So I mean, the Whitney embedding theorem tells you if you have if you have a manifold in uh, of, of a smooth manifold of dimension m, you can embed it in. Well, the easy one, the easy version is you can embed any smooth manifold in R to the two m plus one. And the idea is is really simple. You just embed it into some big Euclidean space. And then you do generic projections to get it down. And you show that as you do generic projections, with probability one, each projection keeps it an embedding. It's the same, you can do this in algebraic geometry too. Any smooth variety over an infinite field embeds into projective space of dimension 2m plus 1, if m is a dimension. But this doesn't work over a fine field. For example, a curve, I mean, for example, let's, let's take a curve. This, okay, so this will, I'll just I'll just state it for a curve, and then we'll, and we'll end here. So as you have a nice curve, and you want to embed it in, project, in P3. If we're over an algebraic closed field or an infinitely closed field, you could do this by putting in some big projective space and then projecting, doing linear projections until you get down to P3. But that doesn't work over a finite field for a very simple reason. It could have happened that Fx has more Fq points than P3 does. In which case, you're not going to be able to find a closed immersion from x into p3. So that's an obstruction. That's not the only obstruction. It could be that x has more closed points of degree 2 than p3 has. So, so you have infinitely many obstructions of this type. And then the, the, the theorem is that those are the only obstructions. So if, if your curve embeds, sorry, so if, each, if for each e greater than or equal to 1, it embeds set theoretically, meaning that the number of closed points of degree e on x is less than or equal to the corresponding number for p3. Then it then it embeds. Okay. So this is this is a, this is an elaboration of the of this of the same kind of closed point sieve that I was talking about. So if you have a sieve pairs of points and okay, but uh, so anyway, that's that's that that's this, that's the last thing I want to say for this. So that ends part one of my series, and then on the next, the next two lectures, I'm going to talk about something completely different. Those, I'll be talking about elliptic curves and Selmer groups and the heuristics that for predicting like how often do you get a particular rank elliptic curve and things like this. Okay, so that's it for today. Thank you.